Well, today I want to talk to you about the topic of kingdom values. Uh, you know, if you want to fit into a kingdom or a nation or a group of people, you need to know what their values are. You need to know what's important to them. If you want to be a productive member of a society, you need to understand, if, if you want to understand a kingdom, you need to know what people hold dear. So let me give you an example. Um, last year, the Ulrichs, uh, when we were on sabbatical, we got to spend a day in Switzerland. So we had a one hour, or not one hour, a one day layover in Zurich. And while we were on that layover, we got to see three things that the Swiss value. So first of all, let me just say they value money because that place is expensive. Okay? <laughs> Zurich is like one of the most expensive cities in the world. So Swiss banking is a thing, right? Um, second, we noticed that they value efficiency. So we wrote the somewhere, whatever you call it there. It was always on time to the minute. And if you ask somebody a question, you would get the, they, they would answer the exact question that you asked very precisely. Not a lot of empathy, <laughs> not a lot of smiling or humor, but very efficient. Okay, switch watches are a thing. Uh, and so anyway, they love their efficiency. Then lastly, we learned that the Swiss love their chocolate. So they gave us chocolate on the plane when we arrived in Switzerland. When we went through the town, it seemed like every other shop was a chocolate shop. And at one point, we wanted to get something to eat at a restaurant, and we went into the door, and to go up to the restaurant, you had to walk over a giant glass staircase that had a river of chocolate flowing clean beneath it. Yeah. I, yeah. I kept looking for balloons. Yeah. Swiss chocolate is a thing. Well, anyway, the point is, we can see some of the things that the Swiss value. And here's the thing, if you were moving them, if you wanted to fit into that kingdom, into that nation, if you wanted to be a productive citizen, you would need to know what values they hold. Well, let me say what's true of Switzerland <laughs> is true in a much bigger way, a more important way of Jesus' kingdom. The kingdom that we, believers in Christ, are a part of. His kingdom has values. And if you want to truly fit into Jesus' kingdom, if you want to be a productive citizen, you need to know the values of that kingdom. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Today we are continuing in our sermon series called The Authority of the King. So this is like Mitch said, this is a study of Matthew 8 and 9, two chapters that have shown us the authority of Jesus again and again. So, so far we have seen Jesus' authority over things like sickness, uh, over nature, over legions of demons. And last week we saw Jesus' authority over sin. He forgave and he healed a paralyzed man. So we've seen stories that show the authority of the king. And we're going to see more stories that show the authority of the king in the coming weeks. But in today's passage, Matthew's going to take a break from showing us the authority of the king. And he's going to focus instead on the kingdom. Matthew is going to show us the kind of kingdom that Jesus is using his authority to build. He's going to show us the values of Jesus' kingdom. So let me invite you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 to 17. Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 to 17. So in this passage, Jesus is going to show us three values that define his kingdom. Three priorities that we need to know if we want to be productive citizens. If we truly want to fit into Jesus' kingdom, we need to know and embrace these values as individuals. And, and very quickly, let me just say these are three values that we as a church have to be very clear about if we want to build Jesus' kingdom. So Matthew is going to show us these values today. He's going to do that by telling us about an encounter that Jesus had with some tax collectors and some Pharisees and some followers of John. So let's read Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 to 17 and see this story. Now, just so that we kind of know where we're at in the general flow of things, in the last passage, Jesus claimed that he had the authority to forgive sinners. And then he proved that authority by healing a paralyzed man. So that's where we're at when Matthew tells us this 
in verse 9. And as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at a tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at table in Matthew's house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? So when Jesus heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came to call not the righteous, but sinners. Then the disciples of John came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch tears away from the garment, and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skins burst, and the wine is spilled, and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins, and so both are preserved. Let's pray. Lord, as we are here to look at your word, I, I pray that your spirit would just move powerfully at once. As we listen to Jesus clarify what he is and what his kingdom is, whether it's about rules and regulations, whether it's about self-discipline, or, or whether it's about grace, I just pray that you'll speak into our hearts, Lord. I pray that we will lean entirely on what Jesus has done for us. So Lord, please speak today. Please apply your heart to the hearts of our lives where we need to see what Jesus has to offer. Lord, transform us. Clarify our thinking. And Lord, I need your help to speak clearly today, so I just ask for your grace as we look at your word. We ask you in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so there's a lot going on in this passage. Um, As we look at the passage, though, we'll see that it gets down to three values that Jesus has for his kingdom, three priorities, three things that are more important than other things. So these three things would have been a surprise for Jesus' listeners, and they're important for us to understand. So let's just look at them one at a time. Okay, I would state the first value like this. Love is greater than conformity. Love is greater than conformity. In Jesus' kingdom, love is greater than, it's more important than, outward conformity to God's commands. And we see this in the story of Matthew's conversion and in the conversation that he had with the Pharisees as a result uh, of that. So let's let's look at, uh, at, at that, and I think you'll understand what I mean. Love is greater than conformity. Okay, so the story begins in verse 9. Look at what Matthew tells us there. It says, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. So Matthew, the guy who wrote this gospel, is telling us how he came to be one of Jesus' 12 main disciples. And as we look at this story, one of the things that we can see right off the bat is that Matthew is not hiding his sin. I mean, to begin with, notice that Matthew has placed the story of his call immediately after Jesus shows us that he has the authority to forgive sinners in the story of the paralytic. That is deliberate. That's significant. And notice that Matthew identifies himself as a tax collector. That was considered by most religious Jews to be a sinful occupation. You know, tax collectors were notoriously crooked. They they worked for the enemy. They were always rubbing elbows with their Gentile superiors, so they were constantly ceremonially unclean. To be a tax collector was to be a sinner. 
And notice not only that Matthew identifies himself as a tax collector, but he points out that he wasn't looking for Jesus. It's not like Matthew went to go find Jesus. He was sitting at the tax table when Jesus called him. So Matthew is very open about the fact that he was a sinner when Jesus found him. In fact, if you keep reading Matthew's gospel, he continues to do this. You know, later in the gospel stories, all three of the Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the three what we call synoptic gospels, they all give us a list of Jesus' 12 disciples by name. And when Matthew lists his name, he says Matthew, who was a tax collector. He's the only gospel writer that does that. Matthew is honest about his need for forgiveness. Okay, and because Matthew is honest about that, notice what happens in verse 10. And as Jesus reclined at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. So Jesus comes to Matthew's house for a meal, and when he does, guess who shows up? A whole passel of tax collectors. Passel? Do y'all use that word? A whole bunch of A uh, whole bunch of of uh, tax collectors and, and, and sinners come, right? You know, they hear that this new rabbi, this prophet, this miracle worker who forgives sinners has called a tax collector to be one of his disciples. You know, they realize that, hey, if we come to Jesus, he's not like going to put a curse on us. He's not going to blow us off. So they come to Matthew's house so Jesus can teach them. And they lay down in the cushions around the table and they share a meal with them. And tax collectors and sinners are finding Jesus. They're coming to him and being taught by him. And everything is great for one hot minute. And then something happens. The Pharisees find out. Okay, look at uh, what happens in verse 11. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to the disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? So the Pharisees find out what Jesus is doing and they are not happy. The, the Pharisees were the sort of popular religious leaders of Jesus' day. And at this point in Jesus' ministry, they are still trying to figure out what they think of him. So they're trying to figure out whether they can endorse him as one of their allies. They're wondering if they should teach Jesus the secret handshake. We have a secret handshake here at Perry Creek. Only five people know it. No, I'm just kidding. But they're trying to figure out whether they should do that. And this raises serious concerns about whether or not Jesus should be in their club. I mean, the Pharisees were very picky about who they worked with. Later in Matthew, Jesus is going to talk about how they'll travel land and sea just to find one person worthy to associate with. And here's the thing. I'm sure it raised some eyebrows when Jesus picked a bunch of fishermen to be his disciples. But now he was choosing tax collectors. And the result was a Pharisee's worst nightmare. More and more sinners were coming to Jesus and eating with him. This would not do. So they go to Jesus' disciples and they offer a little bit of friendly advice, you know, just to help them out, right? They say, look, we're just trying to help here. But why is he doing this? Doesn't he know that those people are probably ceremonially unclean? Doesn't he know that if he hangs out with them, he might get some bad ideas? Doesn't he know that people will talk? I mean, you got to think about the optics of this, right? So what they're saying is Jesus needs to be careful to conform. They're saying, look, if you want to be a rabbi, you got to play it safe, right? You have to stay far away from scandal. It's not just that you can't violate the law. It's that you can't appear to violate the law. And that means you can't hang out with people who appear to violate the law, like tax collectors and sinners. They're saying you can't do that. In fact, the Pharisees had a solution for this problem. It's called fencing the law. Not like fencing the law, but like fencing, building a fence. I thought that was funnier than it is. Anyway, okay. 
but like, like building a fence around the law. And the idea is you don't just forbid what the law forbids, you forbid more. Okay, so put it in American terms of the speed limit is 55, you don't ever go over 45. Right? If, if, if God's law says don't get drunk, then you don't ever touch alcohol. And you don't ever go into a bar and you don't ever shop at a, at a place that sells alcohol. Okay, you just stay far, far away from it. You put a wider fence around the prohibitions of the law, and that way you're sure to be in compliance. Right? No one can accuse you of anything. That was their helpful advice. He needs to conform. He needs to play it safe. Now, Jesus' response to all this in verses 12 and 13, so look at what he says there. But when he heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came to call the righteous not, or, uh, not, sorry, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Okay, so Jesus responds here in three ways. He gives them a saying, a scripture, and a principle. Right? Now the saying is simple. It's the healthy don't need a physician, but the sick do. Okay? This is actually a common saying. Historians have found this in Jewish culture and outside of Jewish culture. And the basic meaning, as it relates to the Pharisees' advice, is clear. Jesus is saying, if you're going to be a doctor, you're going to be a healthcare professional, you're going to have to hang out with sick people. Right? They're the ones who need a doctor. That's kind of the way it works. You can't be a doctor or a nurse and only hang out with people that are healthy and happy and safe and clean. If you're going to be a physician, it's going to get messy. And it's not always going to be safe. But that's the job. You can't just keep your distance. Guys, remember when we were going through COVID? You want to remember that? Remember, remember how we prayed for our health care workers? Um, you, you know, we, because they were with sick people, right? And I have one very special kid that went through my youth department in the 90s. He was a great guy. Had a family. He was an, uh, an EMT. And he went into a house to help somebody with COVID. And he, he could just keep his distance. He had to get close to them to help them. And he got COVID. And he died. He took a risk. Because his job, his calling, was to help sick people. And Jesus is saying to be a doctor is to be with the sick. You can't always play it safe. It's going to be messy. And it's not always going to be safe, but that's the calling. Jesus is saying, look, I came to cure the sick, not to congratulate the healthy. So that's the saying, right? Now, the scripture that Jesus uses is from Hosea 6.6. 6. That's where God says to Israel, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. So in Hosea, in the, in the prophet Hosea's day, Israel was very good at outward conformity to the ceremonies of the law. So they observed the feast, they gave the offerings, they checked all the ceremonial boxes on the outside, but their heart was miles away from where it should have been. They didn't love God. And you can tell it because of the way they treated each other. So God says in Hosea, look, if you love me, you would show mercy to others, but you don't. You cheat the poor, you mistreat your neighbor, there's violence and immorality. So God says to Israel in that passage, you can keep your sacrifices. Okay, what I want from you is not a sacrifice. I want you to love me. I want you to have love for me that results in mercy for your neighbor. So Jesus quotes that. And he's telling the Pharisees, you guys have missed the boat entirely. You're so busy checking religious boxes and looking down your nose at others that you've completely missed the command to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus is saying, my kingdom 
will be different from what you're doing here. Love is greater than conformity in my kingdom. And Jesus closes with a principle. He says, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. And Jesus is saying, listen, this is why I came in a nutshell. To call sinners. I didn't come to glad hand, glad hand, glad hand, glad hand those who think they're righteous. I, I, I didn't come to congratulate the healthy. I, I didn't come to learn the secret handshake from you guys. I came for the poor in spirit. For those who know their spiritual poverty. I came for those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. I, I came to show mercy to those who need mercy. Aren't you glad that's why you came? What Jesus is saying in all this is that in his kingdom, love is greater than conformity. He's showing us as our king that we have to love what God loves. And because Jesus loved what God loved, he was more concerned with helping sinners than he was with blame for not conforming. Love was greater than conformity. That's Jesus' first value here. And guys, here at Perry Creek, we have to reflect that value. We have to love what Jesus loves. And we have to make sure that this church is a place for sinners to find forgiveness. We can't just welcome the people who have their lives together spiritually, right? We can't just welcome the people who are already following the rules, the safe people. Love has to be greater than conformity. You know, guys, I've um, experienced churches where they get it backwards, where conformity is greater than love. I've served in a church like that. They have lots and lots of rules, both written and unwritten, about how a Christian should dress and how they should talk and where they should and shouldn't go and what they should and shouldn't do. You know, I'll never forget one time Kelly and I were in grocery store. This is back in the days when you could rent DVDs at the grocery store. But for you kids, a DVD was a bank round. <laughs> anyway, we're there and we're going through the grocery store. We'd rented some DVDs and one of the church members came up to talk to us. And while she was talking to us, she reached into our cart and went through our DVDs, checking to see if anything was like PG-13 or R, you know? Now here's the thing. She's not a bad person. Okay, that church has changed since the time I'm talking about it. She has changed, but it was all about conformity at that time. And you know, I noticed something over time. When people came to that church, their attention was not on God. It was on us. They wanted to know, can I fit into the culture of this church? How am I supposed to dress? You know, can I check the boxes or are they going to touch me? I remember I had a, a relative who was uh, struggling with addiction. And this guy was going, I, I need God in my life. He did not have a relationship with Christ. And he came to me and he said, look, I think I need to find a church. And I just remember thinking to myself, Man, this guy is not going to fit in at this church. He is not going to go there and go, I just experienced the love of God. And, you know, I told him, I'm like, there's a church down the street, got a really good man, and you'll be loved there. And I sent him there. And forbidding was greater than love. And guys, that's not the church that we want to be. We don't want people's first question here when they come in and visit us to be, can I keep up with the rules? We want their first question to be, why do they care about me like that? Well, why is it, what, what is it about this place that's so different from what I experience out in the world? And how can they be so serious about pleasing God and so joyful? What kind of God do they actually serve? That's what we want them asking, right? And guys, listen, much of the time we do this, okay? I'm not just pounding on you saying you, you're terrible or anything like that. Often when I invite people to Perry Creek, I will say to them, I, I can promise you, we'd be well loved at our church. But we have to hold on to this as a priority. Love has to be greater than conformity. This has to be a place where sinners 
can find forgiveness and join the rest of us forgiven sinners. That has to be our priority. And notice that Matthew actually shows us how to do it. It's not complicated. We see it in our passage. If we want to love people and make this a place for forgiven sinners, we need to be open about the fact that we are forgiven sinners. Right? Can we just say it? We're all tax collectors. Let's just say it. I am tax collector. <laughs> we need to be honest about our past and what God has saved us from. And we need to be honest about our present and our constant need for God's forgiveness, right? That's why we take the Lord's table. We take this table again and again. And you guys have heard me say before, this table is a symbol that God offers His grace to us again and again. But there's an implication there that we just need to state very clearly. The fact that we take this table again and again is also a symbol that we need God's grace. We need God's mercy. If you haven't sinned in the last month, feel free to skip the table <laughs> when we take it today, right? But we need it again and again and again. And if we recognize that and are open about it, what happened in this story will happen to us. As soon as the tax collectors and sinners saw that Matthew had found grace, they started coming to Jesus as well. They came because love was greater than conformity. So that's our first kingdom value that we see in the passage. Now, the second kingdom value we see is this. Joy is greater than self-denial. Joy is greater than self-denial. Okay, so the joy of Jesus' presence is greater. It's more powerful than the merit of self-denial. And we see this value in Jesus' encounter with the disciples of John the Baptist. So uh, as we keep reading in the passage, the, some disciples of John the Baptist, who was a great prophet and an ally of Jesus, they come to Jesus and they kind of lodge a complaint about the disciples. Okay, so look at what Matthew tells us in verse 14. It says, then the disciples of John came to him saying, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? So they're asking why the disciples aren't fasting. Now, fasting is something that we talked about when we looked at the Sermon on the Mount. It's the practice of denying yourself food for the purpose of mourning or repentance or prayer. And the Old Testament it required fasting of Israelites, but it only required it one day out of the year on the Day of Atonement. So that was what was required. Now, some Israelites did a little bit more. They engaged in monthly fasts or fasting in personal times of difficulty. But the Pharisees, and apparently the disciples of John, did more. In fact, they did a lot. Okay? So the law said you had to fast once a year. They fasted twice a week, every Monday and Thursday. Now, I don't know about the disciples of John. They were a little bit more the good guys, but I know the Pharisees made a big deal out of it, right? I'm sorry, none for me. I'm fasting today and Thursday every week. Okay, there's just a sense of like, I, I, I've done it, right? Now, let me say, that is fencing the law, okay? They're doing a lot more than what the law requires. They were overperforming. They're probably like, we're crushing this fasting thing, okay? God must be so pleased with us. And the complaint against the disciples is basically that the disciples are having too much fun, Okay? You know, it kind of reminds me of the Puritans. Uh, sorry if you love Puritans, but uh, I was reading, uh, uh, somebody once had a quote where they said, um, the Puritans lived under the haunting fear that someone somewhere was having a good time. Okay? <laughs> uh, so these guys kind of want to know, well, okay, wait a minute, why do your disciples not pass as much as we do? Do they not love God as much as we do? Do they only do the easy commands? Why don't they engage in more self-denial? That's what they want to know. Now, Jesus' response must have been shocking to them. 
Notice what he says. He doesn't address, you know, well, you need to fast this many times or whether it's a good idea. He doesn't talk about self-discipline. He basically says the reason they don't fast is because I'm here. Look at verse 15. Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? Then the Greek implies the answer is no. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and then they will fast. So Jesus calls himself the bridegroom. And in saying this, he's making reference to John's disciples of something that John had said about it. Earlier, John had said, you know, they were saying, how come so many people are coming after Jesus? And John said, because he's the bridegroom. I'm just the best man. Okay, he's the he's the main star of the show. So Jesus now takes the imagery and he says, I'm the bridegroom. And the disciples can't fast. They can't be miserable because the bridegroom is here. And what Jesus is saying is my presence brings a joy that is far more powerful than self-denial. Notice he doesn't say they shouldn't fast while I'm here. He says they can't fast. And the idea is that joy is greater than self-denial. The joy that his presence brings, the joy that has been promised in the kingdom is far more powerful than the self-denial of law. Jesus is saying, look, if you recognize me for who I am, if you recognize what my presence brings, what I'm doing for you, you can't help but rejoice. In my kingdom, joy is greater than self-denial. Even on election week. Okay? And guys, what's true of the disciples should be true of us. We need to recognize the joy that Jesus brings to our lives. So he brings joy. He's the life of the party. Remember the story of the wedding at Cana? If you remember that story, Jesus wasn't the bridegroom. He was the party guy, right? He was the guy that brought the wine. If you remember the story, he turned water that was normally used for ceremonial washing into wine. And the point is clear. Jesus turns the water of law, the water of self-denial, the water of conformity into the wine of rejoicing. Jesus brings joy. Remember what we talked about last week? I know we're all concerned about the economy, right? I know that there's a divisive election occurring. I know that people are carrying heavy burdens. And listen, we are, so many of you are carrying a heavy burden. I know there's so much in our lives that is not resolved, but our sins are forgiven. Right? How can we not rejoice? Jesus brings joy into our lives. I've got a quote uh, above my office at home that says, the absence of delight is always a sign of my self-righteousness. I first heard that, I was like, that's not true. Now I've watched my life. Mm -hmm. Yep, I'm always saying I deserve better and I'm not kidding. Okay. Did you I I don't know. Okay, (laughs) just kidding. The abs this comes from Dan Allender, by the way. The absence of joy is always a sign of my self righteousness. Thank you for making me relive that painful memory of who I am. No, but listen, Jesus brings joy, right? Now listen, that doesn't mean that we never feel sadness when we see the brokenness of this world, right? Romans chapter 8 tells us Christians feel the brokenness of this world more than non-Christians because we know what it was made for. Okay, so it's not that we never feel that, right? It's it's not that we never uh, deny ourselves. So Jesus says here that we will fast when he's taken away. and It's appropriate for Christians to fast. Sometimes our church has days of prayer and fasting, okay? So we do deny ourselves at times. But guys, we have the bridegroom, right? We win. Okay, God's at work in everything you experience. Listen, this world is head it's not going over a cliff it is headed for a divinely appointed ending a climax a giant wedding feast and everything that we experience every victory that you've had this year every failure that you've had every challenge 
Every temptation, it's going to make sense someday. And we'll see how God used it for good. Now listen, that should bring us joy. And joy is so much more powerful than self-denial. Listen, I've tried it both ways, okay? I've I've lived a life of self-denial to try to kind of measure up to what I thought a Christian should be, and I've depended on God and leaned into His joy. And I can tell you, it's far more powerful than self-denial. You know, the Bible says in several places, the the joy of the Lord is my strength. And I used to just say, nah, that's not a nice Bible talk thing. (laughs) But you know, over the last few years, I've looked at that and it's really true. Joy gives strength. In fact, Kelly could tell you every single time I preach, I ask for more things every single time. And one of those is joy. Because joy is power. Joy is greater than self. Okay, so that's the second kingdom value we have in this passage. So uh, love is greater than conformity. Joy is greater than self-denial. But there's a third kingdom value that Jesus presents here. And this one is important. I mean, they're all important, but this one is overarching. Okay, this one is overarching the other two values. And this is one that we cannot get wrong. If we get this value wrong, we miss the whole point of what we've been reading in the last nine chapters, okay? And it's this. Kingdom is greater than religion. The kingdom is greater than religion. So Jesus closes this passage with two statements that are two snapshots. They're actually like two little new parables that help us understand how his kingdom works. Look at what he says in verses 16 and 17. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment... For the patch tears away from the garment, and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skins burst, and the wine is spilled, and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins, and so both are preserved. Okay, so in the first example, Jesus talks about a garment and a patch. Now, let's be honest, we don't patch very many things these days, right? We give them away or get rid of them or whatever. But in Jesus' day, the garment was a big deal. And so you patched it. And Jesus' point is that in his day, if you took an old garment and you sewed a patch of new unshrunk cloth on that garment, something bad would happen. When that patch, you know, that newer, stronger patch got wet and dried out, the patch would shrink and it would tear away from the garment. So the old garment would be destroyed and the new patch would become useless. So Jesus says that, then he talks about uh, wine and wineskin. So a wineskin was made out of the hide of an animal. So you just take an animal and, sorry, you just peel, peel the hide off like a glove. Okay, then you tan the inside with really mild chemicals so your wine doesn't taste funny. And you turn it right side out again and you tie off the arms and legs and you fill it with wine. Now here's the thing, over time, a wine skin would dry out and harden. And you could keep old wine in it just fine, no problem. But if you put new wine in it, there was a problem. The new wine would expand as it fermented. And and if the skin was flexible, it was okay. But if the skin was brittle, it would explode. It would destroy the wine skin and you would lose the wine. Okay, now in both examples, the point is the same. The new is incompatible with the old. And it's greater than the old. So what does this have to do with religion and kingdom? Everything. See, what has been brought to Jesus in these two encounters is really religion. Okay, so the Pharisees want Jesus to conform on the outside rather than acting out of love. The disciples of John want Jesus' disciples to gain God's approval through self-denial. The point of both of those is that this is what you need to do to get God's favor. That is religion. Jesus is saying that that the kingdom that he is bringing is incompatible with our old religion. 
Listen, the gospel of Jesus is not just a patch that you can sow on to your old efforts to please God. It's not just some new wine you can pour into your old wineskin, your old morality, just to freshen it up a bit. The gospel is completely different. It's not religion. Religion or man's, is, is man's effort to reach to God. The gospel is God's effort to reach to us. We cannot mix religion, any religion, with the gospel. They may look similar on the outside because the moral code has some overlap, right? But if you really look at what they're about, it's what in Zimbabwe we would say they're chalk and cheese, okay? Meaning they look the same on the outside, but if you take a bite, you're going to find out how different they really are, okay? So we cannot mix religion with the gospel. And let me say we know this because Judaism could be mixed with the kingdom. It was the basis for the kingdom. But in terms of mixing that, of going, oh, Jesus is just putting an old, a little patch on it. It didn't work that way. Jesus' kingdom was different and it was far more powerful. Think about what happened to the temple. The greatest symbol of religion, of worship of the true God, the temple, the moment Jesus died, what happened? The curtain that separated the Holy of Holy, God's presence from man's presence was destroyed. It was ripped in two from top to bottom. The old had been destroyed when the new came. Think about what happened to the early church. You know, as Jesus ascended into heaven, his disciples thought that the gospel was primarily for the nation of Israel, right? But when are you going to restore the kingdom? So that was what their total focus was on. But Jesus wouldn't have it. The old could not contain the new. He was doing something new and it took them a while to figure out he's really serious. He wants to reach the nations with this. God used signs and wonders, but he also used persecution and pain because he was going, this will not be contained in the old ethnic boundaries of Israel. History shows us that the new is greater than the old, that kingdom is greater than religion. And listen, what's true of history is true in our lives. We can't mix religion with kingdom. One is about what we do for God to to reach up to Him, what we offer Him that we think will make us acceptable, right? And listen, it will never be enough. No amount of conformity or self-denial will ever be enough. The Pharisees did so much more than you're doing. I promise you. Are you fasting twice a week? Are you tithing the herbs in your garden? I don't think so, right? The Pharisees did more than that. And what did Jesus say? Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will in no wise enter into the kingdom. Listen, religion is about what we do for God. Kingdom is about what God has done for us. It's about our spiritual poverty. It's about our hunger and thirst for righteousness and how God has provided all the mercy that we need in Jesus. Right? We don't deserve it. We don't add to it. We don't improve on it. We just receive it by faith. Right? We admit that what Jesus has done for us is far more powerful than what we can do for Him. Guys, this is a value that we have to, we, we can't get this wrong as a church. And it's a value that we have to understand as individuals. And if we get this kingdom value straight, the others will make sense. Love, joy, All the incredible demands that Jesus gave us in the Sermon on the Mount, if we understand that we are responding out of what God has done for us, out of His mercy, that we are showing Him gratitude and not just self-denial that we can measure up, it will all make sense if we understand that His kingdom is so much bigger than what we want to make it with our religion. We can't get this wrong. His kingdom is greater than religion. Let's bow our heads for prayer. So maybe you're here today, and as you hear me talk about this, you're like, what? I've never heard this, or I don't know how to have a relationship with Jesus that is not based 
on me trying to do what's right and, and just measure up with him. If that's you, today could be the day that you place your trust in Jesus. All you have to do is acknowledge to him, I can't measure up. I've got sins in my past that I can't erase. I've got shortcomings in my present that I can't seem to fix. Jesus, I want what you provide. I want your forgiveness. I want your spirit to live in me. I want you to give me power and strengthen me so that I can serve you better. I know I'll never be perfect, but I know I'll be forgiven. Today could be the day that you do that. There's no formal thing that you have to do for that to happen. All you have to do is ask God for help, for his mercy and his forgiveness based on what Jesus has done. In just a moment, we're going to celebrate the Lord's table. And as we do that, um, it'll be an opportunity for us to declare our faith in Jesus, our dependence on him. Kelly and I will be in the back. And if you'd like to pray for a need that you have, or if you would like to, if you would say, I would want to know more about how I can have that kind of a relationship with you, let me invite you to come to us. We'd like nothing better than to explain to you how much greater the kingdom is. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, um, Lord, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for your challenge. Jesus, we thank you. You know, we, 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 Give our best efforts to be good, nice people. But if we're honest, we look at it, we go, we fall so far short of what we know we're supposed to be. But you don't. So help us to rely on you day in and day out. Make your mercy more in our lives. We pray that you will bless our time at the table, transform us, change us. We ask you in Jesus' name.